Today's talk is called Going Into Labor. And I just want to start off with an example about going into labor. Now, I'll never forget the experience of having twins, okay? And let me just make it clear, I myself didn't have the baby, I didn't give birth, I don't want anyone to be confused about this, okay? I didn't go into labor myself, my wife did, okay? Just want to make sure that people aren't confused about that, all right? So I'm not talking about my, my personal experience, but labor with twins is certainly more, you would say, more difficult, one would assume, right, than labor with one child, yes? And as a result of that, harder work, it would require a longer period of rest as a result of that. There's a lot of deep work that happens inside of us, in this case, giving birth to a child or children, okay, that requires rest, and that's really what we're going to be talking about. We do a lot of labor, a lot of work, and a lot of that work and labor is not just a, an an external labor, but deep labor, deep work that's happening deep within us. And some of that labor is stuff that we've been carrying inside of us for years. In the scripture, we find this cycle of labor and rest all throughout the scripture. You find these rhythms throughout the scripture, okay? You find even in nature, nature pointing, and, and the world oftentimes pointing us to this rhythm. That there's this idea of seasons, or, or there, there, if you will, there's a season for the sun to be up, right? And then there's a season for the moon to be up. You have this rhythm of the earth rotating, and so we have a daytime and we have a nighttime, okay? Even physically built into us, we, when the sun goes down, we know it's nighttime, it's time to go to sleep. But this idea of rhythm or that, that we see in nature, you look all around us. In waves, you see high tide and low tide, right? There's this, this concept of, of rhythms that exists. Breathing, we breathe in, we breathe out. Okay? Life cycle. We're born, we get older. Many of us get married, we have kids. We give birth to them. We continue to get older, and one of these days, we go into the ground, and then... Our body goes into the ground and our soul is to be united eternally with Christ till the second coming. Okay, but there's, there's this cycle that happens. And with little exception, with the exception perhaps, maybe I would say of the Knicks who have just been miserable, right? They've been bad and you, we're waiting for them. If you're a sports fan, a basketball fan, you're waiting for the Knicks to get better one of these days, okay? But in, with the exception of things like that, oftentimes we look and we see rhythms that are constantly happening in nature and all around us. And one of those important rhythms that we are missing, I think, in our modern society is this rhythm of rest combined with labor. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 tells us that there's a season and a time for everything. And then he goes through, the writer of Ecclesiastes goes through and lists a number of different things. And the two appear opposite, but rather are more so complementary to one another. Labor and rest are not opposites, they complement one another. And one without the other, one without the other is in many ways problematic. We're going to hold questions till the end if that's okay. okay. The fourth commandment, if you look in the Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. Within the very commandments themselves, the fourth one was there is this day of Sabbath rest. And this day of Sabbath rest is modeled around the fact that in six days the Lord made the heavens and earth and then he rested so we ourselves follow that model. In case if the people didn't get it, a few chapters later in Exodus chapter 34 verse 21, it says six days you shall work but on the seventh you shall rest. In plowing time, and in harvest, you shall rest. Okay? When God was giving the children of Israel the menna, he said, six days it's going to come. On that sixth day, make sure that you collect enough for two days, because on that seventh day, you're not going to do any work. You're not going to do any of that gathering. The idea of Sabbath rest, you can't miss it throughout the entire Old Testament. And so I say this to you on the eve of Labor Day, which for many of us don't even know what Labor Day is really all about, 
but we know for a lot of us, we're just excited because it's a day off, okay? It's a day off, the kids are, are out of school. I don't know if that's good or bad for you, but for me, that's good, okay? But li kids are off. If you're working, uh, and many of you, your jobs are closed that day. It's one of America's great national holidays. It was started back in 1877. It's so great, though, many people confuse it with which other holiday? Memorial Day, right? No one ever knows. Is Memorial Day in May or is it in September, okay? Memorial Day is in May, Labor Day in September, okay? So, but this is a, it's a nice day. It's, it's a day that honors the American labor movement. And it's always celebrated on the first Monday in September each year. For a lot of people in this country, they're excited because three days later marks the start of football season. The NFL kicks off this coming Thursday, okay? I'm excited just like probably a few of you are, but that's one of the things people love about Labor Day. They know a few days later, NFL, we're getting going. The truth is we all have a lot of work. We labor a lot. And some of that laboring, some of that work is assigned to our jobs, and some of it's assigned to <clears throat> the inescapable reality that we are constantly driving and moving and our souls our bodies our minds lack rest we can't escape talking about rest when we discuss work and so today i want to really pose three questions and we're going to be looking at luke chapter 6 verse 1 to 11 as we look at this text the three questions about sabbath rest are number one why do we need it number two where do we find it and number three, how do we do it? Okay? Why do we need it? Where do we find it? How do we do it? Number one, why do we need it? If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 6. If not, you can just follow up on the screen. But Luke chapter 6, verse 1 and 2 starts off this passage. It says, Now it happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields. And his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, why are you doing this? What is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Jesus is accused here of breaking the Sabbath because in the Halakha, which were a set of Jewish rules at the time, there were 39 rules that were given. This was one of the 39 rules that was given was that you could not reap on the Sabbath. Okay, so as a result, he's accused of breaking the Sabbath, even though a few verses later, if you look in your Bibles, in verse 6, I believe it is, Luke 6, 6, Jesus says, or verse 5 rather, he says that he is, the Son of Man is also the Lord of the Sabbath. Okay, he himself is the Lord of the Sabbath. So Jesus is not turning up his nose here at the Sabbath. Okay, he's not saying Sabbath should be deleted. Rather, he's saying that he's the Lord of the Sabbath, and we're going to explain what that means in just a little bit. Problem is, today, we are a workaholic country, and oftentimes when we speak about this message, the response for some is the exact response that we find with the Pharisees that we'll also be looking at in a few. Okay? Work, for many people, has become sacred and holy. It is the temple. Work is the church. Work is the holy place. We are a workaholic country that doesn't know how to stop. A few years ago, back in 2003, a writer for the New York Magazine, her name is Judith Shilowitz, she wrote a, an article called Bringing Back the Sabbath. Now, Judith was raised as a Jew in her younger years, as Jewish, and she left her faith for many years. But I want to look at certain excerpts from the article, okay? If you want to read the entire article, it's, you can just Google it. It's called Bringing Back the Sabbath. She, she begins by saying, about a decade ago, I developed a full-blown weekend disorder of my own. Perhaps because I'm Jewish, it came on Friday nights. My mood would darken, until by Saturday afternoon, I'd be unresponsive and morose. 
my normal routine, which involved brunch with friends and sharing stories of misadventures in the relentless quest for romance and professional success, made me feel impossibly restless. I started spending Saturdays by myself. After a while, I got lonely and did something that as a teenager, profoundly put off by my religious education, I could have never imagined wanting to do. I began dropping in at a nearby synagogue. She goes on and speaks about her own realization that Sabbath rest was something that she was in need of in spite of its potential abuses. The ability to deeply rest is not something natural for us. And that's the reason why Sabbath rest becomes one of the central acts of Judaism in the Old Testament. It requires an enormous amount of discipline on our parts, I would say especially today, to make sure that we are taking that time of rest as understood biblically, not as a vacation, simply as a vacation day. Four trends that I want to look at that we see in society today, okay, that hopefully will help us understand this a little bit more. Number one is that jobs today are increasingly insecure. There is a long line of people waiting for jobs. And so you got to continue working and driving and pushing yourself. Otherwise, someone else will take your position. Number two, people are working more to survive. Okay? Because we have more toys today, we have bigger houses, we have more expensive gadgets, okay? We oftentimes have developed this lifestyle that we've been told we need. And so as a result, we are working more just to simply make it. At the top, as a result, people are expected to do more. And at the bottom, because they're not making as much, people oftentimes at the bottom of the ladder need to work multiple jobs just to keep up. Third trend that we see today is the influence of technology with work. Because you can work anywhere, it means we work everywhere. Okay? We're never detached. You can be on the opposite side of the world on an island, a remote island, but somehow we find a way to get connected. Because we can work anywhere, it means we oftentimes work everywhere. And number four is the idea that uh, our self-importance has been redefined, uh, that the source of our self-importance has been redefined. Cultural analysts suggest the following. They say that when, in traditionalist societies, we got our meaning from our family units and through fulfilling basic social roles within that family unit, husband, wife, father, mother, brother, sister, parent, child. And as a result of that, what we did professionally was not as important because we were defined ultimately by our family and our family values. Our culture today is the first culture in history, though, that says and defines, that says to us, you define yourself by deciding what you want to be and then attaining it. And then at that point, now you have significance. Which means there's never been a more emotional, psychological, and social pressure on work to be either fulfilling or at least lucrative, okay? These are four of the major trends out there that we see today, which means what? One, two, and three, as a result of one, two, and three, we are more in need of rest. And as a result of number four, people on the inside have less ability to rest and to relax because we're defined by what we do, okay? 
Sabbath or rest is an abiding need that we as people we have. I'm going to talk about Sabbath. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. I'm not talking about the Jewish Sabbath. I'm talking, I'll explain what I mean by that shortly. Okay. Judith Shilovitz, in the article she continues, she says, when Sabbath was still sacred, not only did drudgery give way to festivity and family gatherings and worship, but the machinery of self-censorship shut down, stilling the in eternal inner murmur of self-reproach. Let me read that last part for you again. Okay? When Sabbath was still sacred, she says that the machinery of self-censorship, the machinery of self-censorship shut down, stilling the eternal inner murmur of self-reproach. What's she talking about here? Let me give it to you in an image. Okay? Sleep experts have suggested to know that in order for us to be restored, you don't just need a certain amount of sleep, but we need depth of sleep, okay? In other words, if you sleep an hour and then wake up and you do that eight times, you can't say, well, I got eight hours of rest, I'm rested, okay? There's this thing called REM, rapid eye movement, where we get deep rest within ourselves, okay? Our minds, our bodies, our soul, our, the whole we rest during that, time period. So it's not just the amount, it's the depth of sleep that's, that's important. So when we talk about rest, we're talking about two different kinds of rest. The first one is physical rest, okay? You guys know this guy, okay? When you work hard like a, a, a beast, you just want to lay out and you just want to uh, rest your body for a little bit, okay? But then there's something deeper that has to go on. When I go to get a massage, they always say, who do you want? And I say, give me that big dude over there with the monster hands. Why? Because I have deep issues in my back, okay? I want him to work out those deep knots in my back. We have deep work inside of us that needs to be worked out. The rest that we're talking about on Sabbath is not a superficial surface rest. It's not take a nap. It's not go on vacation. It's deep rest for the inner machinery of self-censorship that we need to constantly prove ourselves to ourselves and others. That deep machinery of self-censorship that, that she talks about here, that would be stilled with this eternal murmur of self-reproach is us constantly saying to ourselves, you haven't done enough. You're not a good enough mother. You're not a good enough father. You haven't finished that work at, at, at your job. You still have that project hanging over your shoulders. You're never going to be enough. You're never going to be good enough. You need to go, 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 do, do, do. And it's never, ever enough. And let me tell you, it's exhausting. What we're talking about here is not take a nap and you'll feel better. We're talking about deep work that needs to be done. One of the people that I used to grow, that I grew up watching in, in sports was a guy by the name of Kobe Bryant. And I know for some of you are not sports fans, but just bear with me, okay? Kobe Bryant, back in, uh, he was, played for the Los Angeles Lakers, and in his first few years, he won two championships playing alongside this giant called Shaquille O'Neal, okay? And after they won those two championships, for Kobe Bryant, it wasn't enough. He needed to prove himself and the entire world that he could do it without the Giants, okay? So they actually had orchestrated this conflict, and I, I, I'm a fan of Kobe Bryant's game at least, okay? They orchestrated this, this thing to where Shaq got booted from the team and got traded so that he could do it on his own. He needed to prove to himself and to the world that he was the best and that he could do it without help from anyone else. Okay. If you take that from that microcosm in sports and bring that into our own lives, we oftentimes are so driven to succeed and to prove that we can do it alone and that there's always more to be done and that we're going to be the best, that we never pause. That work, let me tell you, is never, never enough. The work that we're told within ourselves that has to be done never stops. And so as a result, we need deep rest of the soul. We need that. Otherwise, all the vacations that we take, 
will never be enough. You can travel all over the world vacationing, and if that deep rest of the soul is not done, you'll come back feeling exhausted. Taking vacations without spiritual rest causes us to remain fatigued all the time. And so what we need is deep rest for our souls. Where do we find that rest? In the next two verses, Luke chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, we find Jesus continuing. It says, Jesus answering them said, Have you not read this, what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, and also gave, and also gave some to those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. People oftentimes read this and they say, well, Jesus is saying there's no need for Sabbath anymore. And that's not what he's saying, because a couple verses later, he's saying, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. So he's not deleting Sabbath. What he's saying here is that the Sabbath here, the reg Sabbath regulations were provisional. Okay? They're provisional as opposed to, like, for instance, the moral law. You never find at a certain point that Jesus would say, no, it's okay to break a moral law. You never find that. Okay? The moral law in the Old Testament, we find it's continuing. Okay? The idea of honesty, the idea of um, oneness within marriage, okay? or not breaking the marriage covenant, for instance. The, the idea of what sin is, from a moral perspective, that concept doesn't change. But what we find here with the Sabbath regulations is that there was a provisional component that was given here. The reason it was provisional is because Jesus is our Sabbath. He's the fulfillment of the Sabbath. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. So the reason Jesus could say what he said here is because what he's ultimately telling us and what he's telling them is I am the one where you find Sabbath rest. I am the one who will give you rest for your souls. What he's saying here really means two things means two things for us. Number one, if you want rest, if you want rest, you need to go to him to get it. Number two, if you've gone to him to get it, but don't have rest for your soul, it means we haven't taken hold truly of what it is that we have. Okay? If we've gone to him, but we still don't have rest in our souls, it means we haven't really taken hold of what it is that we have. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. Go back to the beginning of the Bible. God saw that everything that he made, and indeed it was very good. Everything that he made, and it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. What did God always say? After he created something. He said it's good. He, it's good. And then in this section he says. It's very good. What does it mean for us. To have rest. It's for us to be able to look. And say it's good. It's for us to be able to look at. What God has put in front of us. And to be utterly satisfied. With it. For us to say I've done what I can do. And I'm satisfied. More will come later, but as for now, it's time for me to look and to find satisfaction in the work that I've done. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. You're saying, I want rest. There remains a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Through Jesus Christ, what St. Paul is saying here in, in Hebrews 4, 9, and 10, through Jesus Christ we can look at life and be satisfied. We oftentimes look and say, man, this stinks, this situation stinks. Why? Is, like you find sometimes we're just constantly complaining. And I'm like, if we, if we can put on Christ and look at our situations through that lens of Jesus, 
then we'll be able to look and say, only then we'll be able to look and say, it's good. It's good. What he has done is really that good. Let's come back to Judith Shilowitz one last time. She continues on in the article. She says, not even our group leisure activities can do for us what Sabbath rituals could once be counted to do. He's saying, she's saying not even when we get together and play basketball, not even when we go out and we have coffee, not even when we go out and have dinner, not even when we go out and go sailing on our boats, not even, none of that, none of that can do for us what Sabbath rituals were once counted to do for us. She goes on and says, religious rituals do not simply exist to promote togetherness. Okay? What we do here Sunday morning, it's not just so we can get together and do something together. She's saying they're designed to convey to us a certain story about who we really are. And think about the divine liturgy. Think about what we do when we gather together for worship. And we're saying, God, you're this, and you're this, and you're this, and you're holy, and you're great, and you're almighty, and you created this, and you made this, and you came down here, and we were dead, and you came and rescued us. What this is telling us is all of this is telling us a story of who we are and our relationship with God. That God Almighty came and did all of this because we were that important to Him. Okay? Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I, who am the Sabbath, who am the rest, the one who will give you rest, I'm the only one that can give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So number one, why do we need it? Number two, where do we find it? Number three, let's uh, conclude with this. How do we do it? How do we do it? Verse 6 and 7. Verse 6 and 7. Now it happened on another Sabbath, so this is the next week, okay? That he entered the synagogue and taught. So he just finished talking about the idea of Sabbath, okay? And then he goes in the next week and he sits down and teaches. And a man, that, a man there whose right hand was withered, so the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely whether he would heal on the Sabbath, that they might find an accusation against him. Okay, let me continue on through verse 11. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man who had the withered hand, arise and stand there. And he arose and stood. Then Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful, lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy? And when he had looked around at them all, he said to the man, stretch out your right hand. And he did so. And his right hand was restored as whole as the other, but they were filled with rage and disgust with one another that they might, what they might do to Jesus. Okay? This idea of doing work on the Sabbath for them was problematic. They wanted to kill Jesus as a result of that. And we know how the story plays out, right? Problem for some of us, for some people, maybe even for some of your employers, is that the idea of taking rest is, should be punishable by death. If they send you an email, you better get back. The expectation is that you are constantly working. And even if we're not talking about work for our jobs, that inner machinery inside of us is constantly telling us you're not doing enough. You really are not doing enough. Figure out something to do with your time. How could you possibly be sitting and not working right now? How could you not be doing something for your children? How could you not be doing something productive in this world? And part of it is that we miss the idea that Sabbath rest is actually a very important thing that's productive for our souls. But what we find in here that Jesus says, importantly, let me just read to you verse 10 one more time. And he looked at them, he looked at the, around at them all, he said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he did so, and his hand was restored. Sabbath is not simply about doing nothing, Sabbath is about restoration. Sabbath is about us being restored. It's not, people think Sabbath is just sit at home and, and just do nothing. Come to church, then go home and sit and do nothing. 
And that's not what, God is not saying, I just need you to give me a day so that everyone knows that I'm the stuff, okay? And that I'm center of your life. He's saying it's about us being restored. Above all else, Sabbath is to be restorative. I want to give you two internal disciplines and then wrap up with five external disciplines on how we do it. Number one, first one is discipline. For us to do Sabbath correctly, we have to understand that it's a discipline of liberation. It's a discipline of liberation. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 15. Remember, this is God now instructing the children of Israel. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. You were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. If you can't rest, it makes you a slave. And he's telling them you're not slaves anymore. You're not slaves. Okay? Sabbath is not just about being restorative, but it's about a discipline of being freed. We're not to be slaves to our work. We are not to be slaves to laboring. And I'm telling you, as a, as a priest who is doing things for the kingdom of God, if, I could, if anyone here can justify working 24-7, 365, I've got the green light. Okay? I have the spiritual green light to say I'm doing God's work. But I'm telling you, in spite of that, I still need... Sabbath rest. I need rest for my soul. Okay? It is about having a discipline of liberation. And number two, it's about a discipline of trust. It's a discipline of trust. It's me saying, I'm not the one who keeps things going. I'm not the one who keeps the world spinning. I'm not the one who has gotten me to this point in my life. I'm not the one who has made these children that I'm raising the way that they are. I'm not the one who's going to keep this church ministry going. I'm not the one who is really doing God is the one who is going to complete and to do the work. I'm not the one that brought me into this situation that I'm in. It is God himself who brought me into this situation. Whether it's your work, it's your relationship status, it's whatever it may be, we have to ultimately have this discipline of trust where we let go and we say, today I'm not working. Today I'm not laboring. It's time to rest. Let me give you five external disciplines and we'll wrap up with that. How do we do it? How do we do it? Number one, make it very simple for you. Take more time. If you don't rest at all, start off with a couple hours. Start off with three hours. Okay? Start off with three hours of where you say, I'm, I'm rest. I'm going to rest. Okay? If you already do half a day, do a little bit more. Okay? But... Take more time than you're currently taking. Number two, balance your time. Balance your time. What do I mean by that? There's three components in, when you look at Jewish Sabbath, the concepts, the principles, there's three components that are there that I think are really things that we can learn from as concepts. Number one is there's a contemplative part. There's a worship part, okay? So start with worship. Number two, do something that's avocational. If you are a farmer, we don't have any farmers in the house, right? If you're a farmer, then you would not be farming as part of your rest. Do something avocational. You might go fishing. If you're a fisherman, you would say, I'm not going to fish today, but I might go hike. Okay? So do something that is outside of your daily rhythm of what you normally do. Number three is take some time of being inactive. Just resting, relaxing, sitting on the couch, having conversations, drinking a cup of tea, kicking the feet up, watching your kids run around and play, sitting around, looking out at nature, contemplating, meditating, thinking about God, clearing your mind, doing nothing. Okay? So be contemplative, avocational, and inactive. Balance your time between those things. If you're going to start off with three hours, I would say take an hour for each one as a, as a start. All right, number three. We're almost done here. Be accountable. Be accountable. Have someone, I just said to Maura a couple days ago, I said, I need you to do a better job 
of keeping me accountable. Every once in a while, she reminds me, you're doing too much, you need to slow down. You need to go take a rest. You need to take some, kind, some time to yourself. Okay? Have someone that you can be accountable to. If it's your spouse, if it's a sibling, if it's your parents, if it's your priest, if it's a spiritual father, a spiritual mother, be accountable to someone. Number four, inject time of rest into your work. So we don't need to work like animals for six days and then get to the seventh day and say, okay, now it's time to rest. Inject time of rest into your work. You know, I was talking to a... Uh, I was talking to a, uh, an eye doctor recently, and um, the eye doctor says one of the things that we as people, we do constantly is we're always in front of computer screens. Most of us, now we sit in front of computer screens. So now what eye doctors tell us to do is what? Every 20 minutes, look 20 feet away for 20 seconds, okay? Every 20 minutes, look 20 feet away for 20 seconds. Imagine if you did that, but instead of the just looking 20 feet away, you looked either heavenwards or inwards to God who's within you and just took 20 seconds every 20 minutes to stop and pause and find rest and reorient yourself on God in the midst of your work. Imagine how restful your soul would be in Him. If you took 20 seconds every 20 minutes and just prayed the Jesus prayer for those 20 seconds, count up how, how long it's going to take you to pray the Jesus prayer. In the, maybe you'd say three or four Jesus prayers every 20 minutes for 20 seconds, okay? So work that time into your work. And you'll just have to risk falling behind in your career if that 20 seconds is that valuable. You'll have to trust that you can slow down, you can pause and rest. And fifth and final is the importance of community in this whole idea. That when we come together, that we encourage one another in this, that we actually do this together, and that we discuss this together, and that we keep each other accountable together. These are your five external rest disciplines, I would say, to start with. Take more time, balance your time, be accountable, inject time into your work, and the last is the importance of community. The last word I want to give to you guys is this. The only one whose opinion matters on the subject of your productivity is looking at you right now and saying, it's very good. He's satisfied with you. And if we could put that in perspective, that's the starting point for us to find rest in our souls. All glory to God forever. Amen.